Good evening, everyone. And I'm glad that you're here tonight because what you're going to learn tonight is how to look after your heart. The, the proverb says, keep the heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. How can we keep the heart with all diligence? I'm going to be looking at a couple of things tonight. I'm going to show you how to keep the heart with all diligence, but I'm going to also show you about the issues of life. What do you think the issues of life is? The issues of life is the blood that's, of course, being pumped by the heart. And when our heart stops, we stop. So there are many things that you can do that can keep that heart strong. The heart is a muscle. And that muscle is continually beating. And that heart muscle is made up of a whole lot of little cells. So to understand how the heart runs, to understand what it needs, to understand what weakens it, to understand what strengthens it, we need to go to the CBD, the Central Business District of the Human Body. So here is our cell. And this week we've been looking at the glucose coming in. Last night we looked at insulin. And we had a look at the fact that insulin is the key that unlocks the door to get the glucose into the cell. And once the glucose goes into the cell, it goes through a 20-step pathway. And that 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. That's why we eat, isn't it? So that it breaks down in our gut gets transported to the liver, which sends it to the cell. Now, the end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the powerhouse, called the powerhouse because this eight-step pathway delivers to us an amazing 36 units of energy. What makes the difference? How come an eight-step pathway gives us 36 units of energy and a 20-step pathway only gives us two units of energy? It's oxygen. So you could call this pathway an aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen, whereas this pathway is an anaerobic pathway because it doesn't use oxygen. So obviously, by looking at this, if our heart muscle, which is made up of all these little, specifically we'll look at muscle cell, if it's getting enough oxygen, can you see that it is going to be stronger? Can you see that it is going to pump more efficiently? So how can we ensure that, that, that our cells are getting enough oxygen? Well, there's a few ways that you can ensure that the heart is getting enough oxygen, and that is by the way that you breathe. Our body was designed so that our abdominal muscles were used in the breathing process. When you use your abdominal muscles in the breathing process, then you are getting full oxygen quotient. And many people today have a hunchback, many people have poor posture, and also, many people have tight clothes. You should be able to put your fist in your skirt or your pants, allowing those abdominal muscles to go in and out with the breathing process. Now, one of the reasons why people um, don't have a strong back, don't have good posture, is because their abdominal muscles are weak. You see, our abdominal muscles are basically like our, our core muscles. And you ask any... Uh, massage therapists, they can tell the strength of the human body by the strength of the core. So it's very important to have good core muscles because good core muscles mean that our spine is a little straighter and when our spine is a little straighter and our shoulders are back, we can use our abdominal muscles in the breathing process. So it's a little bit what comes first, the chicken or the egg? But really what comes first is those strong abdominal muscles. One lady said, well, my... My core muscles are long gone. I said, well, if you were, you'd be standing like this because it's our core muscles that cause us to stand up straight. And every one of our abdominal muscles is linked to our spine. That's why when you strengthen those muscles, you automatically pull your spine up straight, allowing your abdominal muscles to be used in the breathing process. Many people have become high chest breathers. 
the Framingham study, which is a study I looked at last night, a little town of Framingham, over 30 years, 25,000 people, so it's a very reputable study. They are found by the age of 50, people had lost 40% lung capacity. And we can use the, the old saying in many areas, and we're going to use it in our brain on Saturday morning, that if you don't use it, you will lose it. And our lungs have got, I think, should have about 300 million little tiny alveoli, and those little alveoli is where the gaseous exchange takes place. To ensure, to, so to ensure that we have adequate oxygen so that our cells can get down to here, because if we don't have adequate oxygen, some of our cells are going to run up there. How much energy is that going to give us? Not very much. So very important to strengthen those abdominal muscles. How can you do that? Exercise. You must exercise every day. If you mean, are you familiar with Pilates stretches? You can Google Pilates. You can get a Pilates DVD. You can actually go to a Pilates class in most cities every uh, once a week and start to strengthen those abdominal muscles. You wouldn't think I would be going to be talking to you about abdominal muscles abdominal muscles when I'm talking about the heart. But to get those lungs open wide, we need to be using our abdominal muscles so they're strong, so they hold that spine straight so you can use them with the breathing process. Now another reason why many people don't have full lung capacity is because they don't exercise. Last night I touched on the interval training. What I want to do tonight, I want to go one step further and show you why the interval training is so powerful in strengthening that heart muscle. So let's have a look at the interval training. We'll go over it again for the people who weren't here last night and for the people who were here last night so we can recap it. Interval training, as the name implies, is intervals of high intensity and intervals of recovery and it's usually done for a cycle. Now, how long you do high intensity depends basically on your fitness level. And most of the uh, research that he's done with interval training is usually 20 or 30 seconds high intensity. That's running as hard and as fast as you can, or cycling as hard as and as fast as you can, or doing push-ups push as hard and as fast as you can, or swimming as hard and as fast as you can. It's not very long. Only, uh, let's, let's put in a 20 second, we'll be kind to you, 20 seconds high intensity. That's about a 60 second recovery, usually done for a cycle of six. Now at our health retreat, a lot of people that come to us are not very fit. And I thought most of them cannot do a 20 or even 30 seconds high intensity. And then I heard of a talkback radio show that talked about this and they were doing seven seconds high intensity, 14 seconds recovery for a cycle of seven. I'm immediately interested because I'm a Bible student and if you look at numerology all through the Bible, the factor of seven comes up many times. And you look at the human body, seven holes in our hands, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 28 cycle in a woman's cycle, seven days in a week. The, the factor of seven is woven all through. So I love the seven number. I also knew that anyone can do a seven seconds high intensity. Now remember, this is going really hard and fast. In his book, Pace, Dr. Al Sears, he talked to a lady who was about a lady who was 58. She's very unfit. She did seven seconds high intensity and she needed 15 minutes to recover. Hmm. I tell you that because um, if you're that, <laughs> it's all right, because if you keep doing it every day, you will find that your recovery time will get less and less and less. And your fitness is not determined by how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. The reason why Dr. Al Sears' book is called PACE, and the letters mean progressive. That's the P, progressive. Because as you do it, you will get fitter, you will get stronger, your recovery time will be less, you will be able to go further and further, um, further time, 
and you'll be able to put more of the cycles into your interval training exercise. But the exciting thing about this, it is so quick. It's just a tiny little nugget of a day. You can actually do it for about 15 minutes a day. That's exciting, isn't it? Because most of us, and this is the biggest complaint I have at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, people say, well, I was exercising, but I just don't have time. You know, you don't have time not to do this. <laughs> if you want to enjoy the latter days of your life, you've got to start implementing this interval training. Because remember, we're, we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. We're training for life. And we're training for those latter years of life. So let's have a look at pace. Progressive acceleration. You are moving. This is no gentle stroll. And this morning when Amelia and I were running up and down the hills, I think in the Bombay Hills, is that what they are? Um, there are times when we stop talking. And that's when we're running very, very fast. <laughs> so acceleration, this is no gentle stroll. And as Amelia said, you've got to get to the point where you feel like you're dying. Got that? You feel like you're dying. Because I know with myself, we usually do 30 seconds. When I get to 20 seconds, my body says, enough. But you push yourself. You push yourself that little bit further that little bit further, and every day you'll go that little bit further. If you want to bring your, your fitness program down to 15 minutes, you're going to have to be working very, very hard. But it's just a little chunk, and it makes an incredible difference for the whole day. And what are you putting into that muscle cell? What are you putting into that heart cell? You are delivering massive amounts of oxygen. I remember when I was a little girl, I was in a family of seven, and we all were real skinny and we squeezed into the little Morris Minor. And sometimes we'd go to the bush and have a picnic. And, and one day, when we got in the car, the car wouldn't start. So Dad went out and got a jack handle and poked it in the front and wound up the engine, got it going, jumped in the car and off we went. We we're right. Do you know that's what this does in the morning? It's like you're getting the jack. Maybe it's a very old illustration. <laughs> and you're winding up that body and... Whew, It'll run at a more efficient and effective rate all day long. That's why the morning is the best time to do it. So let's look at pace. Progressive acceleration, cardiopulmonary. The C is talking about cardio. We have our fitness um, coordinator at our health retreat. His name is Howard. I think there are pictures of him on our website. He's 52 and all the guests think he's 35. <laughs> he's very fit, he is very strong and he rides his bike to work every day and he rides up hills like this <laughs> and his resting heart rate is 46. That's pretty low, isn't it? 46 beats per minute. I think Howard will still be working for us at the age of 90, <laughs> the way he's going. <laughs> he's, uh, the guests cannot believe this guy. And you know what he does for fun? So let's think about it. He wakes up the guests at 6 o'clock. So what time does he wake up to get the guests up at 6? He must wake up at 5. And he takes them through their exercise program. Then he goes home and he usually goes on another exercise routine with his wife. And then he has breakfast. And then he comes back later and he massages the male guests. And in the afternoon, he, he lights the steam bath because our guests have a steam sauna down by the creek every afternoon where they get hot in the sauna, then they dive in the creek, back in the sauna. So he, he probably gets home about six at night. Now, one evening, Michael and I are going to town. We're about an hour from town. And we're coming home from town. We're halfway home and it was dark. And we saw this light on the road. We thought, what's that? And we got closer. It's a cyclist. We got closer. It's Howard. For fun, after work, he goes and rides 20 k's on his bike. Wow. We've worked with Howard for 15 years. Do you know he's always the same? He's always exactly the same. Do you know what this tells you? This exercise, this pumping of oxygen right into the cell, this is happening in all your brain cells. This is actually affecting the way you think. It's affecting the way. It's affecting your mood. It's affecting 
every single part of your body because you think about it we are just a bunch of cells but these cells specifically that we're looking at tonight are the heart cells because that heart muscle is made up of muscle cells so progressive acceleration of cardio pulmonary if you don't have a 46 beat per minute heart rate do you know you can get it you can get it we may not all come up to the standard of the Olympic Games, the Olympic athletes, but we all can be fit. Howard's fitness is not genetics. Howard's fitness is because he works at it. And anything in life, you more, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. So progressive acceleration of cardio pulmonary what's pulmonary that's the lungs I've already touched on the lungs and the only way to prevent losing 40% lung capacity by the age of 50 the only way to prevent losing 60% lung capacity by the age of 80 is to move those lungs every day you got to get it to the point where you're literally heaving every day and if you have lost lung capacity you can regain it so if, you, if you've lost it, you can regain it. If you haven't lost it, you can prevent losing it. That's the good news. And that's going to affect every cell in your body. It actually makes the difference whether you've got energy or haven't got energy. The bottom line is, for chronic fatigue syndrome, is just lack of oxygen. Because look at that. My cell's got oxygen. How much energy have I got? 36 units of energy. Wow. Compared to two units of oxygen so if you want to feel good you've got to move so progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion there's your pace you are exerting yourself big time what I didn't tell you yesterday about this equation was the effect of this exercise on the cell now to to understand this we need to know that this process here or this this 20 step pathway is very fast this 8 step pathway is very slow and when you're getting to the end of your 20 or 30 seconds high intensity the 20 step pathway speeds up the 8 step pathway speeds up no wonder you're starting to move very fast but when you start to go faster, a rate setting enzyme's in there that will always have this pathway faster than this pathway. So when you're starting to move and move fast, you're going to produce more pyruvate than you can use. And so now the body stores it as lactic acid. Here's our lactic acid stores. You've heard of lactic acid? Mm hmm. Now, listen carefully because I think this is the most exciting part of this whole equation. When you're in recovery time, what's recovery? Now, recovery might be... It, it might be standing still, just getting your breath. In fact, we had a big hill this morning and so halfway up, we stopped. And in our recovery time, we were doing some stretches. So recovery time might be still. Sometimes my recovery time is just going slowly down the hill. Often my recovery time, compared to running as fast as I can, is just walking. So depending on your fitness, depending how you feel after your high intensity, depends on recovery. If someone's really fit, their recovery time might just be <laughs> like this compared to going for it. In recovery time, your liver converts this lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. Do you know what this means? When you're in recovery time, just standing still maybe, your cell is burning just as much fuel, just as fast as when you're running for your life. Isn't that good news? So when you're in recovery time, it's not an excuse because you can't go any further. It's necessary to mop up your lactic acid. Question. 
If someone goes on a 5k jog without stopping, what's happening to their lactic acid? It's building up, isn't it? It's building up. And tomorrow night, I'm going to show you the acid-alkaline balance in the body. We're going to look at foods that leave uh, acid ash in the cell. We're going to look at foods that leave an alkaline ash in the cell. Have you ever read stories in the newspaper? Al Sears has quite a few in his book about a 45-year-old guy doing a 5K jog, kills over, dies, heart attack. Yeah, we've all read of the stories. And the couch potato says, hmm, look at that. Look at him. Didn't do him any good. So he stays on his couch. <laughs> do you know why that happens? Let me tell you. Let's say the man the night before, had a very acid meal. What would be an acid meal? Uh, steak, uh, chips, uh, bread, uh, sugar ice cream for dessert, maybe some red <laughs> wine at the meal. All of those foods break down to acid in the cell, which we'll look at tomorrow night. He goes to bed, he gets up in the morning, he doesn't drink water, which is alkalizing. He drinks that what is it, Gatorade or, you know, those high energy drinks, more acid in the cell. He's jogging along, the lactic acid's building up. What's happening there? We get a tip of acid at the cellular level. A tip of acid at the cellular level slows down the blood and he has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Whereas there is no known heart attack of a person in the middle of interval training. And you can see why, because in recovery time, what's being mopped up, students? The lactic acid. No wonder, no wonder the trainers are finding today that this interval training gives their athletes an edge. When they train with the interval training, their, tra their, their athletes have that extra little go, which is necessary, of course, to win the race, to break the gold was very popular, was be just becoming popular before the war. In Germany, a lot of trainers were doing this. In the war, a lot of things were lost. Then a Japanese trainer, he started doing it in about the 80s. In fact, in many uh, gyms, you can do, go through the Tabata protocol. Doug McGuff, he's another uh, doctor, cardiac surgeon, who started to put his patients on that with remarkable results. Doug McGuff says, when you start implementing this, we're not going to be able to hold you down because you're going to be, when can we start moving? <laughs> For the people with chronic fatigue, you say, do you exercise? What's the answer? Oh, you don't understand. <laughs> I don't have the energy. Guess how you get it? <laughs> and remember, you can start with seven seconds. <laughs> But you've got to push yourself a little bit more every day. And so interval training, that type of exercise is one of the most powerful ways to keep the heart with all diligence. So we're going to make a list of how to keep the heart with all diligence, and that's interval training. And remember, don't have time is no excuse. <laughs> We've got 24 hours in a day. Everyone's got that little bit of time. You've just got to make time. You've just got to make an appointment with yourself. So to keep the heart with all diligence, you've got to move that heart. And remember, it's going to get easier. Something else that's necessary for keeping the heart with all diligence, we did try to get this board clean. Oops, it's going, it's going. There's only one way you will not be able to do the interval training effectively, and that is if you're dehydrated. And the other thing that can really slow it down is if you have had breakfast, because it takes 1,200 calories to digest a meal. So when you're exercising, you've got a lot of movement happening in your stomach. And when you start exercising, the blood, need, the blood is needed in your muscles. So can you see there's a little bit of a, um, a, little bit of a war starts up. They start fighting for who's going to have the energy. So very important, number two, that you be well hydrated, water. The water loss in a day is about two and a half litres. That's 1.5 litres 
out through the kidneys, uh, 0.5 of a litre out of the skin, 0.3 of a litre out of the colon, and 0.2 of a litre out of your lungs. That's two and a half litres a day. So two litres must be replaced. The other half a litre can come through herb teas, maybe your juice, maybe your salad, maybe your fruit salad. You're getting some moisture there. But that water must be replaced. Keeping the heart with all diligence, those muscles need water because out of it are the issues of life and the best blood thinner is water. <laughs> but for us to access that water, we need sodium. Sodium in the form of whole salt. Now, let's have a look at the highest concentration of sodium on the planet is seawater. So seawater contains... 92 minerals and of those 92 minerals, 30% is made up of sodium and 50% is made up of chloride. Now because they make up the largest amount of the minerals in the seawater, the first crystals formed when the water is evaporated from seawater is sodium chloride. And so what man does is he scoops that up, bleaches it white, puts aluminium with it so it runs freely. There's your table salt. And your table salt is a dangerous salt. It only has two minerals, sodium chloride. And if you were in to inject sodium chloride straight into the veins, you would kill the person. They're very harsh minerals, those two. They need to be buffered with all the other minerals. The salt that we use is Celtic salt. And Celtic salt has 82 minerals. Where are the other 10? Well, they're in such pico proportion, barely measurable, that it's inevitable that they're lost in the evaporation process. But hey, 82 is a lot closer to 92, isn't it? Now, in that Celtic salt, there are three magnesiums. So magnesium sulfate, there's magnesium bromide, and magnesium chloride. Mag magnesium is an incredibly important mineral in the human body. It's responsible for about 400 enzymic functions. Magnesium is very, very important in the heart because there are two minerals that cause that heart to beat. Well, there's a few, but basically these two. Calcium constricts, magnesium relax, relaxes. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. And so an important part of getting proper heart health, especially if someone has high blood pressure, is magnesium. Magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, which means it absorbs water into itself. And when you put Celtic salt in a bowl, on the table, and we have a lot of rain, you come and look at that salt and it'll be quite wet because it's absorbing the moisture out of the air. When you take a crystal of this Celtic salt and put it on your tongue, already the mucous membranes in the mouth are absorbing the minerals. It is taken in the blood to the cell and that magnesium causes the water to be drawn into the cell. It's the quickest way to hydrate the human body. Now, around the cell, there isn't one membrane, it's a bilayered membrane. And when the water rushes through the cell into the CBD under the action of magnesium, a little motor is triggered in that membrane to start spinning and the spinning of that little motor gives us a unit of energy. So when everyone at work is going out to get their coffee or their cigarette to get a boost, you just get your crystal of Celtic salt, put it on your tongue, have a glass of water and you watch that little energy boost that you will get. And you won't get the drop like they will all get. They might get an initial rise, but then there's always a corresponding drop and I'll explain that process in a little bit more detail on Saturday morning. Quickest way to hydrate the body. The soils are mineral deficient today. The plants are mineral deficient today. And so doing this every glass of water is an excellent way 
to start to recover some of the minerals that so many people in New Zealand, Australia and America today are deficient in, especially the magnesium. Now there is one drink that leaches the magnesium and the calcium out of the body and that is caffeine. Now there was a bit of a groan last night when I mentioned this one. <laughs> I call it Australia's darling. Is it New Zealand's darling too? What's a darling? Something they love. And it's, it's very, very effective at leaching the calcium and the magnesium out of the body. And most people don't realise that that coffee is a huge contributing factor to dehydration, to heart malfunction and also to imbalance in heartbeats. So there are some things that have to stop if you want to keep the heart with all diligent and one of them is caffeine because of the way it leaches the, uh, the magnesium out of the body and as you can see by what I just described, magnesium is so important. Anyone that comes to me with high blood pressure, uh, we do quite a few changes but we always supplement with magnesium because it keeps that heart muscle at rest. You see your systolic is your high point and your diastolic is your bottom one. It relaxes that di diastolic and brings it down a little bit. And the Celtic salt can do that. But how often are people with high blood pressure told to what? No salt. Now there are three, well there are four vital elements needed for life. Let me, let me draw the four vitals. And you can find this in any anatomy and physiology book, any chemistry book. Number one is oxygen. Number two is water. Number three is sodium. Did everyone hear that? And check me out on that. Go to your anatomy and physiology book. And if you don't have an anatomy and phy physiology book, please buy one. We need to know about this house we're living in. The number four is potassium, and potassium is found in all your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're the four vital el elements needed for life. So if anyone's told they should stop salt, it's very unscientific. It's incredibly unpractical. And what's a baked potato without salt? What's avocado and tomato on spelt sourdough bread without salt? Our palate tells us we need salt. Last night I quoted that verse in the Bible. It's Matthew 5 verse 13. Yeah, the salt of the earth, if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. How does salt lose its savour? This salt here with its two minerals, has lost its savour. What's the savour? It's all the other minerals. There's a book on salt written by a French doctor named Dr. Lilangri. He says, in France, there is no issue on salt. In fact, he's surprised at the issue he sees made of salt in Australia, New Zealand, in America. He said, we don't have this issue in France because in France, it's hand harvested salt. It is whole salt. You see, one extreme is table salt. The other extreme is no salt. They're both dangerous. We need to come in the middle. We need that balance. The body runs according to precision balance. You think about it. We cry seawater. We sweat seawater. Baby swims in seawater, in utero. We urinate seawater. Now, you don't have to taste your urine. You might taste your sweat. In fact, in the war, in the Navy, they used to transfuse with seawater if someone needed a blood transfusion because it's very quickly converted to blood. Seawater is called an isotonic solution because it's almost the exact same balance and proportion as is found in the human body. I don't suggest you drink seawater. It's not very nice. But you can take that crystal of Celtic salt before every glass of water. Dr. Robert Thompson in his book, The Calcium Lie, he maintains it's impossible to overdo it. And he maintains that you need to do that every glass of water just to replace the minerals that you lost yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
If you're not used to salt, start slowly. <laughs> we have had guests that say, but I don't have any salt. Let me show you what's happening with no salt. Lining your gastrointestinal tract are villi. Villi look like this. And there's a little receptor site there. And the glucose comes down and comes into the receptor site because it's going to come into the blood. And in that receptor site, there's a carrier. And the carrier says, I will not accept you glucose unless you come with a molecule of sodium. Aha. Uh -huh. And if there's not enough sodium, that glucose cannot get in. That glucose ends up in the toilet. You can read that in the anatomy and physiology book. No wonder sodium's the third most vital element needed for life. I memorized this out of the anatomy and physiology book because I wanted to give it to you from the horse's mouth. Sodium is the main transport system of nutrients across the brush border and into the blood. We need it. But we need to have it the way it's found in nature. And that is with all of its other minerals in its perfect balance. So we need the whole salt. How much do we need? As much as you can take. <laughs> it's not nice when there's too much salt in a meal, is it? And it's not nice if there's not enough salt. Your palate will tell you. Have you ever seen people using table salt and they put it on everything? before they even taste it. Do you know why? Because these two harsh minerals kill the taste buds. No wonder they have to put it on everything. It kills the taste buds. We need salt, but we need to have it in the way that it's found in nature, in all of its balance. So the, the water and the salt are very, very important. But the way to take the water into the body is little by little by little. Sip it. I never used to drink water. I was breastfeeding or pregnant non-stop for 14 years. So I am an expert on breastfeeding, child raising, childbirth, because <laughs> I did it for so many years. And I helped many, many people because of my experience. But I didn't drink water. I didn't think I need to. I would just have a cup of tea or a cup of Echo or Caro. I thought I'm getting enough through my fruits and vegetables. Do you know I often used to get migraines and headaches? Whenever we travelled, I'd get headaches. I hated travelling in the car. I'd always get headaches. I got colds often and I'd get terrible sinus. And then I started to study the body. And then I started to study how much water we are. And then I started to look at what happens when you don't have the water. So I began to drink more water. Do you know I never get a headache now? I can't remember my last headache, so I should never say never, but it's very, very rare. I can't even remember my last cold. It was a few years ago. And when I do get a cold, I don't get any sinus problems. That is so nice. We have a book at our health retreat. It's called One of the Body's Many Cries for Water by Dr. Batman Gehelgic. We'll just call him Dr. B. And another title to his book is, He's Not Sick, He's Thirsty. That was me. <laughs> another title to his book is, Don't Treat Thirst with Medications. Many are sick purely because of dehydration. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a not negotiable thing. You just got to find out how to get it in. Have the water in the car. Have the water by your bed. Have the water in the kitchen. Have the water in your workplace. Sip, sip, sip. And if you sip, 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 and if at the beginning of every glass you take a crystal of Celtic salt, you won't be running to the little house quite as much. And you can see why? Because the water is going to get inside the cell. So it's absolutely essential that we be well hydrated. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out as it are the issues of life. We need to nourish the heart cell. Tomorrow night, we're going to look in detail when we look at the acetyl alkaline balance on the best food. But let me just define the three essential food groups. So here we have the three essentials. We touched on this last night. One essential food group is fibre. 
Fibre is necessary, and we looked at this when we looked at diabetes, because it slowly releases the nutrients. And it's in the fibre part of food where you'll often get a concentration of your nutrients, specifically in the peels. Another essential is protein. Once you take the water out of the body, the next most prominent nutrient is protein. You cannot heal without protein. The new cell is built up with protein. And the other essential is fat. You see, 50% of this membrane around our heart cells is made up of protein. And 50% of the membrane around this heart cell, muscle cell, is made up of fat. But many people stop fat because of cholesterol. Am I right? Well, because it looks like I need to really clean my board <laughs> with soap and water, I'm going to give you a break. And after the break, I'm going to show you the whole cholesterol issue. And you might have seen the Catalyst show a couple of years ago where they showed that cholesterol does not cause heart disease. And I do have room to write this. There is a book you can get, and you might like to, buy, to write this down. It's an e-book called The Cholesterol Lie by Dr. Dwight Lundell. Now, Dr. Dwight Lundell is a cardiovascular surgeon, and he has performed 10,000 bypasses. Notice the book that he's written, The Cholesterol Lie showing that cholesterol is not what causes heart disease. There's another book called The Great Cholesterol Deception by Dr. Peter, uh, Peter Dingle. He's, uh, he's from Perth. And if you looked at the show on Catalyst, I don't know whether anyone looked at it on iView, last August, Fat or Fiction, it shows there that cholesterol is a non-issue. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. So I'm going to give everyone a break now and allow me to clean my board so it's nice and white again. And when we come back, I'm going to show you what cholesterol is and I'm going to show you how it works in the human body. Remember the old proverb, Proverb 14 verse 6, knowledge is easy to him that understands have a look at cholesterol because there's a lot of um, really misinformation about cholesterol. So with cholesterol, 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose. And 20% of the cholesterol that the body makes is made from fat. You see that equation? It's not the butter on the bread, it's the bread under the butter that's the problem. And last night we looked at the dangers of wheat and how when the, heat, when the wheat was hybridised in the 1950s, it produced a type of wheat that is very difficult for the body to, to handle. Now last night we looked at how it gets the blood sugar level up higher than even sugar because of the type of starch that was cre created in the hybridization process. And in a minute I'm going to show you the gluten and how it actually affects the function of the heart. But first of all we'll look at cholesterol. Now there are two types of cholesterol, two main types. There's high density lipoprotein called LD. HDL and LDL is the low density lipoprotein. So let me draw a, a uh, heart vessel here and show you what's happening in the heart because HDL and LDL they're like the maintenance team on the on the blood vessels in the body and HDL's role is to carry away excess cholesterol so it's called the carrier Whereas LDL, it's the repairer and the rebuilder. That's its role in the body. So when you consider that LDL is the repairer and the rebuilder, where are you going to find LDL? <laughs> You'll find LDL wherever there's a need for repair, wherever there's a need for rebuilding. So the two different types of cholesterol are 
high-density lipoprotein, HDL, and low-density lipoprotein. Because of its low density, LDL is always found on the edge of the blood vessel. And because of its high density, high density lipoprotein is always found in the middle. That's where you'll find the two different types of cholesterol. Now let's say a person is a smoker. 4,000 chemicals in one cigarette and that can cause damage in the arterial wall. So the chemicals in cigarettes can cause a hole in the arterial wall. Uh, mercury, it's a neurotoxin. It can cause a hole to be made in the arterial wall. Yeast or mould in the blood can cause a hole to be made in the wall. And if the person's on a high wheat, high sugar, high alcohol diet, feeding the yeast, can you see what's happening? What's going to plug up the hole in the arterial wall? LDL. LDL plugs it up. Remember what LDL is? The repairer and the rebuilder. It'll plug up the hole. That's what it does. Now what's supposed to happen is the person's supposed to stop smoking, the person's supposed to get out of the mouldy house, the person's supposed to uh, get the mercury fillings out of their mouth or instead of having tuna and salad for lunch they have uh, hummus or lentil burgers and salad for lunch. The person's supposed to stop smoking and drinking and high wheat, high sugar. And at the same time, that's a person supposed to be eating highly nourishing food. So where's your fibre? All your plant food, plant-based have fibre, your whole foods. Where's your protein? Your protein is found in your legumes, your, your lentils, chickpeas, lima beans, tofu, only if it's organic, nuts and seeds. And where's your fats, your nuts and your seeds, and also your coconut oils, your olive oils? When a person is eating those nutrients, the body can heal the whole. Can you see that? All those nutrients basically are all the building materials that the body needs to heal the whole. And then HDL comes along and takes away the excess cholesterol. Can you see how these two work together? in maintaining the arterial wall and often LDL is blamed as the bad cholesterol. The body doesn't make anything bad. Hmm? No, they work together in maintaining arterial strength because if nothing plugs up the hole, the blood can leak into the tissues and we can die. What an amazing body that God gave us. But do you know what's happening with many people? Many people don't realise what the smoking's doing to them, or the drinking, or the wheat, or the sugar, or the mouldy house, or the mercury fillings in their mouth. Many are sick through ignorance. So they continue. And the person's so busy, they don't have time to cook the lentils, and all they've got time for is cereal, or the quick sandwich for lunch, or the quick pasta two-minute noodles for tea. And so they don't have the nourishment needed to repair the hole, not just plug it up like LDL, to actually repair it so HDL can be taken away. And so what's happening in the arterial wall? It's building up and up and up and up and up and up. So what's happening in the arteries? It's called atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. When I worked as a psychiatric nurse for 18 months, I worked in the operating theatre and we would do basic surgical procedures on psych patients. And we did a bypass one day. And when the, when the artery had been taken out, and what do they do? They actually cut one from the leg here and sew that in the heart. And by the way, that artery wall is not made of strong stuff like this artery, so it's not going to last as long. And the surgeon got the artery that had been cut out and he got like tweezers and he started to pull the white gristle out of the artery. And we look at that white gristle and we go, oh, that cholesterol's bad. But you know what is never addressed? 
Why is it there? Uh huh. <laughs> Why is it there? And you know, some people don't have any buildup on their arteries. Why do some do and why do some don't? Newton's third law of motion states that to every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There is always a reason. And so what people are told, it's the fat. Yeah? It's the fat. It's not the fat. In fact, every muscle... Every cell in the body needs fat. The brain is the fattiest organ in the body. About a year ago, Time magazine did an article on fat. Front page of Time magazine, little curl of butter, and it said, fat. No, it said butter. Why we were wrong on the fat. And it was about a six-page article and it addressed all the research that had been done in the, or quoted in the 80s saying fat was bad, showing that all this research was flawed research. It's not the fat. <laughs> fat is not the problem. And when someone has a heart attack or someone has a bit of a build-up and a potential to heart attack, what do they put on? Cholesterol lowering medication, yeah? Well, your liver is the organ that makes cholesterol. And what this uh, medication does, two of the most popular are Lipitor and Crestor, they block the pathway in the liver that the liver uses to make cholesterol, thus stopping the body making so much cholesterol. But that pathway is also the pathway that the liver uses to make coenzyme Q10. Have you heard of coenzyme Q10? That's your heart protective enzyme. So someone has a heart attack, goes on cholesterol-lowering medication to prevent a heart attack, they can actually be increasing the risk of heart attack. There is no research to show that Crestal and Lipitor prevent heart disease. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. There's even a book called The Human Cost of Lipitor. Let me tell you the side effects of Lipitor. Muscle wasting, interested. Uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss. And they've added another one to that now, breast cancer. Because it's from cholesterol that all our hormones are made. In fact, if cholesterol levels go too low, that person's going to be vitamin D deficient and there are 2,500 receptor sites on the DNA for vitamin D. Body can't function without vitamin D and vitamin D is made from cholesterol. Sex and stress hormones can't be made properly if you don't have enough cholesterol. Too low cholesterol is just as dangerous as too high. I've had guests say to me, well, my husband's on Lipitor and his memory's gone. I don't know anyone who's interested in muscle loss, memory loss, or Alzheimer's or dementia. Are you? And you can actually very safely come off cholesterol-lowering medication immediately with no ramifications. It is not proven to prevent heart disease. It's a non issue. What causes heart disease? Absolutely the build-up in the artery, but why is the build-up there? It's because of the high sugar, high wheat, high alcohol diet. It's because of the lifestyle, basically, that, uh, that many are doing today. It's a whole lot of little things that are causing this. So another no is not fat, but it's wheat. Why wheat? Well, when the hybridization process of making the wheat, the gluten or protein structure of wheat was changed. So originally, wheat was inkhorn. No, I don't think that I should be there. I think that I should be there. Enkhorn wheat, that was the original wheat, and it had a very fragile structure. 
And that fragile protein or gluten structure means very easy to be broken down, so easy to be broken down in the grind, in the cooking, in the chewing, in your digestive enzymes. And it is not sure when, but a few thousand years ago, there was a, a field hybrid with another wild grass that produced emma wheat. And emma wheat is not quite as fragile, but it is still fairly fragile. And it is the emma wheat that was, went through the intensive crossbreeding. So the hybridized wheat that was hybridized in the 50s went worldwide in the 70s. So by the 1990s, in New Zealand, in Australia, in America, every pasta, every wheat, every cereal, every donut, cake, etc., etc., is made of the hybridized wheat. And that structure of that hybridized wheat is incredibly complex. Very difficult for the gut to break down. And you look at the timeline, 1990s, well established, that's when all the gluten intolerance, gluten sensitivity, gluten uh, intolerance to the point of celiac. Celiac can't even touch it. Gluten intolerant, really, they should only have it once in a blue mood. Gluten sensitive, they can probably have a slice of bread or wheat. <laughs> so basically, gluten sensitive, gluten intolerant and gluten uh, to the point intolerant to the point of celiac basically is just um, describing the intensity of the intolerance. Can you still buy the original? You can buy spelt and you can buy kamut. And spelt and kamut have the same structure of the emma. So you can still buy that. You can still buy spelt. Spelt and kamut, you can buy it as pasta, you can buy it as bread. Celiac, who are severe intolerance, often they can't even handle the spelt or the kamut. But often gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant can. Now if that hybridized wheat was made into a sourdough bread, because of the culturing process, it breaks down the gluten structure to make it a little bit more fragile. And if spelt is made into sourdough bread, it can bring it back to that original structure of the inkhorn wheat. Now, if someone eats wheat and they have an intolerance to it, do you know it can get that blood pressure up? So blood pressure can be caused by wheat. So how do you know what you are? I've got a challenge for you. Stop it for two months, see what happens. <laughs> well, what will we eat? Well, you can buy some very nice spelt and kamut breads in New Zealand. <laughs> Go to your health food shop. You can buy gluten-free pastas. You can buy gluten-free cereals. But as you saw in my lecture last night, and by what I explained before the break, the three main essential food groups are your fiber, your protein, and your fats. What we need to do is get the carbohydrate part of our diet down, down, down. So what do we eat? Well, I'll tell you what I ate today. For breakfast, I had some new season apple. I had some uh, nectarine. I had some almonds. I had a gluten-free uh, bread that had been bought that had buckwheat and some very nice grains in it. I had olive oil on that, I had avocado on top of that, and I had black-eyed beans on that. Very high in fibre, everything had fibre, generous amounts of protein and some healthy fats. And then I'm, I'm not hungry again, I think we ate at 8 o'clock today, and I think we had lunch at 2.30, something like that. You're not hungry to learn. Fantastic, because those foods keep the body going. They slowly release the nutrients. What did we have for lunch? Well, we got some magnificent fresh corn, so we all had a big cob of corn each. We had a big salad with avocado. We made a guacamole, mashed up the avocado with some oil and salt and uh, lemon juice. And then uh, we had baked sweet potato. You call it kumra. And then I blended up cashews to a milk with garlic and salt, and then I cooked um, broccoli in that, 
and I'd already cooked some chickpeas, which I'd rinsed well and put into that. That was our lunch today. It's a quarter past eight, I'm not hungry, and I don't expect to get hungry again. Can you see that food takes you the distance? Very low carbohydrate. When you eat like that, you hardly need bread. So no caffeine, no wheat, and no refined sugar. Refined sugar is dangerous. It clogs up the arteries. It makes the blood very, very sticky. And you can get so many delicious sweeteners like honey and maple syrup and even the coconut sugars. There's no need to go to the refined sugar. Alcohol is bad news on the heart and tobacco. They must stop if you want heart health, keeping the heart with all diligence. And number four, sorry, we've done number four. This is number five, is high fibre. All your plant-based foods are high fibre. Generous amounts of protein and your healthy fats. Now there are two herbs that work very well in strengthening the heart and you may have heard of this herb. It's number six we're up to. It's the hawthorn berry. And I wouldn't be surprised if you've got hawthorn berries growing in New Zealand because in Australia they grow in Victoria because they love the cold climate. I think they're originally from um, England. And because the English came here, I wouldn't be surprised if they bought the hawthorn berry. The hawthorn berry strengthens the heart. It brings it back to normality. Often people have heart arrhythmia, often caused by caffeines and wheats and refined sugar, not even realising that the food they're eating is causing the problem. But hawthorn berry can bring it back to normality. It's an incredibly safe herb. You might get hawthorn berry tablets and have one three times a day. If it's not doing it, do two three times a day. Do four three times a day. It's very, very safe. You see, if you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. That's why these things must be implemented. You must keep that heart with all diligence. So the hawthorn berry, if your blood pressure's too high, it'll bring it down. If it's too low, it'll bring it up. The other herb is cayenne pepper. Now, cayenne pepper is one of the most powerful blood thinners that there is. About 15 years ago, at our health retreat in Melbourne, uh, the chef was giving a cooking class to 15 guests, and I got a call. A lady had had a heart attack. She was about 80. She'd already had a couple that year of my, minor ones. So I ran. I was at the health centre in three minutes. The guests are standing around, terrified, of course. The lady's on the ground. She's totally pale. She was half conscious. A guy was holding a pulse. He said, the pulse is almost gone. I said, quick, get the cayenne pepper. I quickly got half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper and put it in her mouth. She was half conscious. I said, give me a bit of water. She was able to drink a little. And it must have been two minutes, and the guy holding a pulse yelled out, the pulse is strong. I looked at this lady, all the colour had came into her face, and she sat up and said, what happened? It was absolutely incredible. I'd read about it, but now I saw for myself. And everyone standing round was going, whoa. I said, no, it's not me, it's the cane pepper. <laughs> now, we sold out of cane pepper, that program. Everyone was absolutely amazed. What did it do to that lady? What it did to that lady, now remember it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go right round your whole body. And when we put the cayenne pepper in her mouth, the sublingual glands under her tongue immediately absorbed that cayenne pepper. So it took one minute to go round the body and when that cayenne pepper went into the blood, it thinned the blood. It opened all the little capillaries and got a powerful delivery of blood all through the body. Amazing. Doesn't it burn? Feels like it does, but it doesn't. What you need to do is get a very good quality cane pepper. If it's brown, it's old. It should be bright 
orange in colour. So you're best really to go to your health food shop. Because sometimes in the supermarket, I've looked at cane peppers and they're brown, they're old. But in the, in the health food shop, you'll, you'll be able to get a nice sparky one. And <coughs> you'll get used to it. I am. In my, t in my sourdough toast in the morning, I put the toast, I put about a teaspoon of olive oil, wonderful oil for the heart, and then I sprinkle about half a teaspoon of cane pepper over that. Then avocado and then black-eyed beans helps, softens the blow <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you sandwich it. Some people love it. If you know, and some people think, I, I, I don't want to have every mouthful hot. What you can do, I say start with a quarter of a teaspoon and a little bit of water and just throw it down. It'll tingle, but it'll settle down in a few minutes. And have that three times a day. You can even build up to a half a teaspoon three times a day. There's a book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. And there are ten pages in that book devoted to cane pepper. And you can even Google a book... Um, it's, you, can, you can get it off the internet. Um, I think it's the only way you can get it. It's called Curing with Cain by Sam Beiser. Remarkable book. This guy claims that cayenne pepper can even rebuild heart muscle. That's quite incredible, isn't it? You see, cayenne pepper brings blood wherever it goes. And remember what blood is? It's the life of the flesh. It's the river of life in the body. So... Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So basically, when you look at the heart and you look at the blood, the same things help them both. Now, there is something else that is a very powerful blood thinner, and that is ginger. And you can have ginger as a tea. One of my favourite teas is to finally grate ginger and pour boiling water on it. That makes a delicious tea. Very sparky. If it's too sparky for you, just water it down a bit. And ginger is also not only a blood thinner, but it's a very potent anti-inflammatory herb. And on Saturday afternoon, I think from 6 to 8 o'clock, I'll be doing natural remedies where I'm going to be demonstrating, uh, I'll be demonstrating a ginger poultice and also um, other poultices. Garlic. Garlic has been studied for about 20 years now on the wonders that it, or the wonderful effect it has on the heart and on the blood. And uh, omega-3. Now, the most powerful way to get your omega-3 is, I believe, in the plant kingdom, which is your ground flaxseed or linseed, same thing, and um, chia seeds, Chia seeds are very easy. If you have smoothies, throw them in your smoothie. One thing I love to do at home is I squeeze a grapefruit, get the juice, and I put a cup, oh, maybe a heaped tablespoon in the grapefruit juice, mix it around. By the time I've chopped up my other fruit, it's like a soft jelly, and you put your fruit in that. It's a delicious way to have it. And walnuts. These three foods are the highest in omega-3. Flaxseed's the highest, chia is the second highest, and walnuts come to a close second. So you might have ground flaxseed and chia for breakfast, and you might have walnuts for lunch. And they will keep the blood nice and thin, especially in conjunction with drinking adequate water, having the whole salt, and, uh, and having these basically as part of your food. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine, then. Medicine be your food. So also, very important, early nights. I mm -hmm. think we've heard this one before. <laughs> very important to go to bed early. From last night, do you remember the hours of power, the hours where your batteries are recharging and healing accelerates? Ten till three. Except in the winter, then it's nine... Nine till two, nine till two in the winter time. And they are the hours many people miss out on, or they only get half of them because usually of technology. So it's a good idea to start winding down. If you're on the computer, turn it off ideally by nine. 
and um, and so that everything is winding down. Very hard for your brain to shut down quickly when it's had um, so much stimulation through the eyes. Now there is a hydrotherapy treatment that can um, boost heart function and it can also boost uh, the blood moving through the body and that is cold. So what I suggest is you have your hot shower. I'm very kind to suggest your hot shower but always end with about a 10 to 20 seconds cold. Now this is a good time in the middle of summer to get used to it. And you watch, if you can start to get into the habit of that, if you find the cold hard, turn the hot up uncomfortably hot and then you almost welcome the cold. Now I've been having it here and yes, your cold is <coughs> very cold. <laughs> but it won't hurt you, it is a fantastic tonic. And remember, you're so hot and steamy that it's just, and you can run round and round in the shower. <laughs> And just think of Amelia and I diving in our creek. I'm not asking you to do that. Just have a quick cold shower after every hot. It's one of the best tonic effects. See, what the hot does, it starts the stimulation, stimulates the movement of the, of the uh, blood through the body. But after about five minutes, it starts to slow down a little bit. And if you turn your hot shower off and go out into cool air, you can chill. But if you have your hot shower, end it with cold, that'll wake you up. In fact, a young man said to me one day, I was getting a bit concerned because he was having a coffee every morning. He said, I've just found out something just as powerful as coffee and yet it, you don't get the downer. I said, what's that? He said, a cold shower. <laughs> that'll wake you up. And you might go like this, <laughs> don't worry about that. It's a, it's a wonderful tonic and you get used to it. You'll get used to it. Just like the cayenne pepper, you'll get used to it. Just like feeling like you're dying in the interval training, you'll get used to it. And especially when the brain says, it's all right, this, this is very good. And on Saturday morning, where I, at 11 o'clock, where I'm going to show you how you can rewire your brain <laughs> and show you how you can be rewiring your brain right up until the, the day that you die. So if you start implementing this right away, you'll be already starting the rewiring process. That is how you keep the heart with all diligent for out of the, of the issues of life. And that doesn't cost a lot of money, does it? In fact, with most people, it's just some little adjustments in a few areas. So you can have salt and pepper on the table. I have salt and pepper. In fact, I travel with salt and pepper. It's my little shaky bottle of Celtic salt and the cayenne pepper. And then if someone has a heart attack on the plane, I'm all ready, aren't I? <laughs> they might lock me up if they see what I do, though. <laughs> Are there any questions as we close? Yes? Uh, rewiring the brain Saturday, 11 o'clock. What's the duration? It'll be one hour. Yes? Ah, good question. Is Himalayan rock salt as good as Celtic salt? Himalayan rock salt does have 82 minerals, which is fantastic. But the Celtic salt has more magnesium. So they are both very good. I personally like the Celtic salt. Uh, not as much as it does have. It does. Ha, it does get moist, which is a f is fantastic. When your salt gets moist, you know what you think? Great! It's got lots of magnesium in it, but not quite as much as the Celtic. But it certainly still does have some magnesiums in it. Yes. Sure. Lipitor, the side effects of Lipitor. You can go to the web and, you know, you can put in Lipitor and it'll put the side effects up for you, which is memory loss, um, Alzheimer's, dementia, muscle wasting and breast cancer. They're, they're well, when the muscles waste, they ache. That is true. So aching is one of the signs. 
It is a cholesterol lowering medication. No, no. You have to get a script for that one. Yes? Baking soda. Baking soda. Is that supposed to be um, for you? No, no. Um, tomorrow night we're going to look at the acid alkaline and baking soda is, is probably one of the most alkalising substance there is. But if you take baking soda by mouth, it'll just neutralise your stomach acid because that's the only part in the body that should be acid, is the, is the stomach. Now, Dr Tullio Simoncini, he's an Italian oncologist that has been injecting sodium bicarbonate solution straight into cancers and the cancers are gone. They just, they can't survive in the alkaline environment. Um, so unless you're a doctor and can inject the sodium bicarbon solution, um, which of course we can't. But at our health retreat, when people come to us wanting help with um, cancer, we do sodium bicarbonate wraps. So it's a quite intense treatment. Um, we use about two kilos of sodium bicarb, five litres of water, we dig duct towels in it and wrap, wrap the body in that. So sodium bicarb does have a place. Um, internally, I would only get someone to take it if they had stomach cancer. And I would only advise it, say, first thing in the morning and last thing at night when there's no food in there. So that's, that's a specific there. And you can put sodium bicarb, of course, on the skin. Any other? Yes? What about caffeine-free caffeine coffee? The caffeine is not there, and often it's been extracted with chemicals, which means you've got chemical residue in there, and you've also got a few other chemicals still in there. So it's, it's not really the best option. You had a question up the back? Um, if, you, if you do the interval training and when you go through recovery time, basically if you do a high intensity of uh, 20 seconds and then have a recovery time of 60 seconds, the lactic acid is mostly mopped up just in that recovery time. And that's why the interval training is so effective. But if you don't have the recovery time, it certainly can hang around. Well, all the Lipitor does is stop the liver making cholesterol. So the Lipitor does not clean up the arteries. No, no, no. So once you've got clogged arteries, the, the option then is to either have the arteries blocked or stop them from the legs. So no, no, it's not. I've got some excellent news. Say someone has 80% occlusion of their arteries, and we've had guests do this. If they implement this, and the blood thinners, that, that can all be taken away because remember that's your HDL role is to actually take that excess away. Yep, all it needs is the right condition. Now it won't happen overnight, <laughs> depending how clogged it is, it will take it away. Now, warfarin um, is rat poison. You, you're probably aware of that. It causes the rats to bleed to death. But they don't give enough to humans to make them bleed to death. Um, the side effects of that are pretty scary. And warfarin only thins the blood. Warfarin will not take this buildup away. Aspirin supposedly thins the blood, but research is coming out now that it's also causing brain bleeds. Now, you want... You know what brain bleeds can lead to is Alzheimer's. So there is no need to take warfarin and there is no need to take aspirin. We've had a, quite a lot of guests come off those, implement this with fantastic results. There is a formula and if you buy it, buy it, the body works, yes? Are there any good supplements to replace the medications? Are there any good supplements to replace the medications? 
Probably the only thing that I would add to that, and we'll put it on a 10, is magnesium. And magnesium citrate is the most absorbable form of magnesium. But if you're having your whole salt, you're getting magnesium there, and the natural natural form of magnesium is found in your dark green leafy vegetables. Now remember, when you cook vegetables, you do not lose the minerals. You only lose the minerals if you throw the water away <laughs> that they've been cooked in. Yes? Turmeric's excellent anti-inflammatory. So I probably would advise turmeric supplementing with turmeric more for arthritis to get the inflammation down. Yes? What do you think about frozen vegetables? Frozen vegetables. I don't think they're the best option, but I think they're a better option than canned vegetables. <laughs> so if... Um, I would advise having mostly fresh, but frozen probably is your second best. Thank you for your attention tonight. My time is up and I know you're eager to get asleep by 10 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night where we have a look at the acid-alkaline balance in the body.